the matter of the people of the state of California versus Orenthal James Simpson, case number BA09. And so, my fellow Americans. Yeah, go ahead and get that, Biden. And uh, we are back. It is Wednesday. We are another two days closer to Halloween, which is very, very exciting, which means we're going to keep doing, I guess we just unofficially started doing a Halloween series where we just do scary stories that aren't the typical. Well, I officially did it. And then you like, didn't you? I officially followed you officially doing it. I mean, yeah, now we're well, doing it. Somebody, somebody had to be the leader. And unfortunately, Taylor, that had to be you this time. How about that? Thank you. Um, so Taylor covered her story last week or on Monday. I'm going to cover mine today. And oh, doomed to fail. Yep, we're doomed to fail. You know who we are. I'm Fars. That's Taylor. We're very thrilled that you're listening to us. Our listenership is going up. Very much thanks to the hard work and the TikTok graphic videos and all the fun stuff that Taylor's putting together. So thank you. Please tell your friends. We will send you good vibes. Lots of good vibes. Free. Yes. Um so what are you drinking? What is that? That looks fancy. That looks like a nice beer. It's just, it's not fancy. It's you just made fun of me for this last last week. It's a it's the St. Adams Oktoberfest. But you know what? I like what I like. It's a classy looking bottle. Yeah, sure. It's got Sam Adams on it, I imagine. It says Brewer Patriot. One time, I think I told you this before that I went to um, Colonial Williamsburg for Christmas one year. Yeah, and yeah, it was yeah. so fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah and so one of the things that we did is my, my, my sister-in-law and um, two of our cousins, we went for like a girls' night at like the pub. And oh my God, it was, so it was like cold and you like walk through this like, town like you're really walking through this town you open the door and it's like it's like being in an old-timey pub there was like a guy with a fiddle like singing a song and you're drinking beer out of these like big like like pewter pewter goblets and like we're eating like cheese and bread and like it was amazing it was like one of the most fun nights i've ever had why doesn't somebody create that because when i went to hobbiton and i went to the green dragon that's what it was you go into the green dragon they're serving you beers in these giant fucking like old-timey mugs and everybody's fun it's just every all the floors creak wherever you walk. It just has like this oh mood. God, to like it. leaky cauldron. I'd go to that a million times. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so there's a place in New York that you would definitely know, McSorley's, that I kind of get that vibe from. Yeah. Which like, yeah. But, like that's kind of the only one I can think of. Yeah, it's because they haven't cleaned McSorley's in like 75 years. So it's like that's like the vibe that you got. It's kind of like my kitchen sink. Uh, sweet. So we can go ahead and kick things off. So Taylor covered her historical take on the Winchester house of Sarah Winchester on Monday. Today, we are going into, you know what, Taylor? I wrote this outline. I actually gave you credit in this outline, and then you called me out. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to still give you credit, just so you know I gave you credit, because I'm going to read it right from the outline. The outline says, it is spooky season. So taking inspiration from you, Taylor... I wanted Huzzah. to go with the horror theme. There you go. Thank you. Very exciting. Since you covered ghost ships last week, I thought I would do the next part of that scary math, which is mm-hmm. scary houses. And you also did that. So I... I'm also following you. Well, you knew what I was going to do. So, yes. Should I? Okay. It's, it's going to get really dark in here. I think, I think I'm okay. I think I'll, think I'll be okay. I want... Okay. I'm literally... going to let it get dark and have that be like part of the mood. I'm going to turn this light on. Hold on. I have this little, I have this little mister. I'm going to turn my mister on. Oh God. It's not working. Oh God. Should I, should I hold one of my crystals? Do you have any crystals? I do. I have this black one that's supposed to calm me down. And then I have this like other one. I'll hold this black one. Okay. Because like I said, ghosts aren't real, but also I'm afraid of ghosts. So we don't know that ghosts aren't real. Time. Nobody knows that. Taylor's That is pure conjecture on Taylor's part. Uh, go ahead. So I'm going to come, I'm going to converge several topics here that are awesome. One is haunted houses. The other are unsolved mysteries, not the Robert Stack version, but the concept of unsolved mysteries also and awesome. okay. axe murders. So yes. those three all come together Wait, I, in today's I story. Other crystal. <laughs> What is that, a green crystal? I'm ready. I found my, I found my other crystal. I'm ready. Go. Okay, we're safe. All three of these coming together in today's story, which is about the Velisca axe murders. So let's get into it. Let's dive right in. Velisca is a tiny town in Iowa. It has a population of 1,100 people. 
as of the 2020 census. Today? Yes. Okay, great. And is mostly known for this crime and the birthplace of a future crazy person. You might know this person, Randy Weaver. Mm, I don't know. Uh, white, it up. white supremacist, sovereign citizen who moved his family into a part of the town that they weren't going to have any electricity or water. He's he's the main guy who kicked off the Ruby Ridge standoff. Ah, okay, got it. There you go. So looked into Villisca a little bit, trying to get a sense of feel for the town. So uh, there's currently three homes for sale in Villisca. All of them are about $100,000. <laughs> Uh, it is a very low budget town to live in. It is very small. They have one eatery called TJ Dine, TJ's Cafe. They have a general store, and the general store does serve like like fried chicken that you could go in and buy and then take home. But that's Love basically that. it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there's yeah. not much going on there. And at the time that the crime that we're talking about took place, the town was like way bigger percent so it was twice the size population wise and a lot more bustling but like everything in america was like less dense than it is now and so a 22 2300 mm-hmm. person town that's still like a decent sized town for that back then what year is it we what are talking about the early 1900s okay 1912 specifically got it. okay so the victims of our story are a family called the moors which they, this could also be called the Moore's family axe murders. The Moore's consisted of a father named Josiah, a mother named Sarah, their four children named hilariously Herman, because how many children do you know named Herman? Mary, Arthur, Paul, and another set of victims unrelated to the Moore's were two little girls who were called Ina May and Lena Gertrude, who were friends of their daughter. So we have eight people in this house. Got it? This $179,000 house is cute as shit in this neighborhood. I know, but what would you do there? You just well, go to I mean, What do I do here? Days? I live in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it's not, like, it's not like you're confined to your town. If you looked at Joshua Tree, you'd be like, there's nothing there. But there's a Walmart in the town next door. You're like, you're, you're right down the street from Coachella Valley. You can't met me up at dinner at like a five-star steakhouse, like 30 minutes from your house. But you're not living um, in the middle of nowhere, Iowa. I'm just I'm just a work from home champion at the moment and trying to get people to still do it. But continue. Oh, this one's hey, cute too. I met Taylor. I met somebody else this weekend. Oh yeah, I remember what I did on Friday. I met somebody else this weekend who they were hired to do like project management remotely, and then like they were hired like two years ago to do this remotely, and yeah. they said, "Hey, uh, the jig's up. You got to start going to the office." Boo. So I think it's like it's like catching on. I know it is. I know it is. If you have a remote job that's been telling you to go to work, he writes to us and let us know so we can like start <laughs> creating like a union or an association for this. So that's a really good idea. Right? Um Yeah. Okay. So per I'm what so is sorry Sally? I didn't interrupt you. All good. I interrupted myself again. <laughs> so Going back to what is now our norm, I'm going to set this up within three acts. So act one is the crime. Act two are the suspects. Act three is our conclusions. So act one, the crime. You ready? I am. I love this one. I'm going to hold my my crystals. On June, she's holding her crystals up. There's two of them. Uh, (laughs) Visual medium. So on June 10th, the Moore's neighbor, a woman named Mary Beckham, knocked on the door. This is this is a Monday, June 10th, 1912. It's a Monday. Mary knocks on the door of the Moore home and nobody answers. She gets concerned because she doesn't see the Moors come out and do their chores. This is 1912. You gotta put your laundry out, you know, you gotta put your do all that Mm -hmm. shit. She got concerned and she called Josiah's brother, Ross, who also lived in town, to come over. Ross had a key to the front door, so he opens the front door, he walks in. And he stumbles across two dead bodies. The dead bodies he stumbles across are Mary's friends, Lena and Ina. He runs outside and tells Mary to call the local officer. They call them peace officers, which I guess that's like, that was what you called them back then. I think, I think, I think that's the time where like 
I don't feel like I talked about this in like Bonnie and Clyde where like the cops aren't like real cops. It's like a dude who that's like second job. Yeah, yeah. Like he's a dog catcher some days and some days he's the mayor. It's the same job. Yeah, yeah, totally. hundred percent. So this peace officer comes over, he searches the house and he finds the bodies of the six Moors and the two girls that Ross had earlier found who were there for the sleepover. It was determined that they, that all eight had been bludgeoned to death by an axe found at the home, which also belonged to Josiah. The investigation found that there were two cigarette butts in the attic, which led investigators to conclude oh. that the killer was hanging out in the attic and came down and started just fucking hacking away at these people, which is like so I know, scary. I know you're gonna talk. I know you're gonna like talk about the Hinterkai effect, right? At some point. No, but it is literally just like that. <laughs> Okay, it's the same story. And there's like a there's a theory that's the same person, you know? Whatever. But that is so fucking scary. It's one of the scariest things in the whole entire world. Someone living in your attic. Wait, they even if I don't end up killing you. Wait, you mean the hinter Kaifek is the same person as this guy? Some so in that book, I think I told you this when I read talking about Hinter Kaifek, the um the guy who wrote the man from the train that I read a while yeah. ago, his theory is that like, it's, he's like a, it's Paul Mueller, this German yeah. immigrant who did a bunch of ax murders in America and then went back to Germany and then did Hendrik Heifek and like whatever else there. And then they like, disappeared into to Europe history. Yeah. That can't, he, Paul Mueller came up in this one too. Wow. Okay. Interesting. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't cover Paul Mueller because I don't think that was him. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if he did hinder Kaifek either. But like the thing is, like he, he was someone who definitely murdered people from in close yeah, proximity yeah. to train stations. Yeah. For context, the reason I didn't do this guy was because the any weirdo in town was a, a, a suspect at some point in this. Like they rounded up like half the yeah. town at some point. So like uh, the list is like thirty four people long, and like it's not a good story. It's just like this guy once like laughed hard and squirted milk out of his nose so they all thought he did it like you know what I mean? like it's just like stupid stories like that so anyways totally two cigarette butts in the attic the assumption was this guy was up there waiting to strike when he did strike he went up with the parents first josiah and sarah were asleep in the same room so police don't know who they who he attacked first but apparently they beat the shit out of josiah to the point where his eyes were gone i i sleep with an axe next to my bed taylor do you really yeah, I used to have a knife, a knife there because I have. I feel like I, a knife is what is the weapon of choice for me if someone's robbing me. But I don't even know where it is. Yikes! Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> this whoever this person is then went for the more children and killed them before making it to Ina and Lena. Apparently, Lena is the only one that had defensive wounds on her, indicating that she was the only one that was awake and knew what was going on when it was happening. She also oh, had her baby. underwear removed, and investigators, mm. her underwear was pulled down, her blouse was pulled up, and so mm. investigators said that she was not sexually assaulted, apparently. So, hmm. thank God for that, I guess, whatever. Um, so, yeah. okay. that's the crime part of it, and there's some underlying circumstances about what happened in this city that I want to get to before I get into act two and who the suspects are, because the, the reason I'm covering the suspects that I'm covering and not the 34 other people that I mentioned earlier is because of the things I'm going to tee up here. So Taylor, have you heard of a thing called children's day? I figured as a mom, you might know what this is. No. Okay. So apparently on the second Sunday of June, every year, we in the U.S., and it happens everywhere, it, it's different days in other countries, but in the U.S., it's the second Sunday of every June. We're supposed to be celebrating a thing called Children's Day, which is basically a day where kids are just, like, force-fed Christianity. So, like, yeah. I assume it's kind of, like, a fair, like, atmosphere, but there's also, like, sermons and stuff, and otherwise, like, it would just be church, I would assume, right? If it's just, like, we're just going to do sermons. So it's got to be, like, a fair, I assume. Right, just like extra church, but for kids. Right, we'll talk about right. Noah's Ark and shit. Yeah, yeah. So the second Sunday in June of 1912 was the day before the bodies were found. So that's the first thing I'll I'll plant the seed of planted. The second okay. is some background on Josiah Moore. So when Josiah was starting out in Vel Veliska, 
He worked for a man named Frank Fernando Jones. Frank owned the Uh only hardware store in town and had a very lucrative exclusivity deal to resell John Deere farming equipment. He made a shitload of money, apparently. He built himself the biggest house in town. He started a local bank. He eventually would move on to be a senator. Um, And so he had like a really good thing going for him. Like he was kind of like the man in Beliska. Josiah worked for Frank until he asked for a pay raise and Frank refused him. So what Josiah did okay. was he went away, he established his own hardware store in town and wrestled, wrestled away that exclusivity deal that Frank had with John Deere. Probably, arguably worse than that, Josiah also had an affair with Frank Jones's eldest son's wife. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So this was like obvious. Okay, we're, we're talking about sons of a patriarch in a small town. Mm-hmm. Like it's, these are these are big outsized things that are going on essentially. So Frank really yeah. didn't like Josiah at all. It's clear. Okay. Okay. Got it. So let's. We have some background information there. So now let's move on to Act Two, the suspects, which I think the first one's going to be kind of clear by now. So the first suspect is Frank. So obviously Frank hates jo- Josiah. Uh, he basically taken away his standing in the community of being the biggest, baddest, best hardware store in the area. He, he humiliated his son with his affair with his wife. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's kind of the, the, the first suspect. Nothing came of this yeah. because there's no evidence that would tie him to it. The second person is connected to it in some way. And it is assumed that Frank Jones hired him. It's a guy named William Mansfield. So Mm -hmm. this is crazy. In between the years of 1911 and 1914, there was just a bunch of unsolved. I'm going to go lock the doors. Hold on. I'm just going to shut myself. (laughs) Lock the door open. It is now officially dark. Yeah, I I don't need to. I can see Fred's window. It is officially dark outside. Yep. Definitely don't need to be killed by my own axe. Wait, I'm going to go grab the axe. I'm looking at pictures of the house. It looks nice. You know, the farmhouse. I love like kitchen. Well, I love china cabinets. If you've been to my house, I have like five china cabinets. I just like desperately want more. I don't want anything else but china cabinets. But like in like, an old fashioned kitchen, it's like china cabinet, or, like the stove, you know? It's cool. Okay, wait. Let me take a screenshot of us. Hold on. <laughs> I have to turn on my ring light. How do I take a full? I want to hold my. How do I do both? Should I, it's, it's should I pretend like I'm hitting something? Okay. Uh, I'm just going to hold my axe. Uh, so, okay. <laughs> um, okay. So, where I was going with this is that between the years of 1911 and 1914, there was, like, all these unsolved axe murders around the country. So, mm-hmm. there was – this is just in three years. There was one in Colorado Springs, two in Kansas, one in New Orleans – one in Aurora, Illinois. One in Blue Aurora, Island, Illinois, Illinois. Right on. Wait, no, we're not in Illinois. No, I know, but in in Wayne's World, Wayne's from Aurora, Illinois. He says Aurora, Illinois. Oh, right Illinois. on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Blue Island, Illinois. I'm gonna come back to the Blue Island one here in a minute, but so keep that one in mind. But the key thing yeah. to note is that all these murders in these three years. How many is that? Hold on. One, two, three, four, five, six, six, seven, seven, including. Seven axe murders in three years, all unsolved. They all shared the exact same crime scene, including the Moore house. Sheets were put up in the windows to shield outsiders from looking in. The murderer, the murder, the murder weapon was always an axe and it was always wiped clean when the murderer left. The murder victim mm-hmm. always had, oh my God, Luna, don't bark right now. I can't do this. The murder victims always had their heads covered with clothing. This is creepy, Taylor. The mirrors in the house, houses were always covered up. I hate that. That's so fucking creepy. I hate, I hate the mirror thing so much. And I feel like this is scarier than ghosts. I mean, maybe you'll talk about ghosts later, but this is like a real actual live person with an axe came to your home. So freaky. So freaky. And there was never fingerprints found for any of these. Nobody, could, nobody, There was no way to tie any of these together. And back then, dude, the 1900s, did they even know what fingerprints were? Do people even know what fingerprints are now? Like, it's like, 
there's gotta be someone that knows it's gotta be tied in some way like it's not good Mm -hmm. so there's a detective we're gonna introduce his name is james wilkerson and he was convinced that all these murders were all related and that the murderer was this guy mansfield mostly because of the blue island murder in illinois that i mentioned earlier so what happened there is that Manfield, the Man, Mansfield's own family was hacked to death with an axe. So his wife, child, mother-in-law, father, like every, the whole family was wiped clean. He was never charged with any murders in the family. He was most just known as like a cokehead, like just like a weird drug addict that just like kept fucking fucking around, riding the rails, going from city to city, doing whatever. And mm-hmm. he was he was basically the the detectives in the, in the thing were like, this is the guy that had to have done it. He was ultimately arrested and brought before a grand jury, and the grand jury concluded that there was sufficient evidence to prove that Mansfield was not in Villisca on the night of the murders because of a receipt he produced from Illinois from that same night. That being said, the detective in the case... Yeah, right. Go ahead, sorry. Oh, I just... A a receipt in 1922 is a piece of paper that someone wrote around with their hand. Yeah, you know, like I'm looking at like Sarah Winchester's ledgers of her like of her wealth, and it's all like handwritten in like an actual accounting book. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like you can write whatever the fuck you want. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and, it, and it's it, it was so to that point. Uh, Wilkerson was not only convinced that Mansfield had done this, but he thinks that he did it at the behest of Frank Jones. Like he assumed that Jones was like, "Fuck this family, fuck this guy." And mm-hmm. I know this guy who, like, clearly murdered his own family, so he's probably not going to be having any issues killing another person's families. And so the mm-hmm. idea was that uh, he would hire him to do this. The short of it is that he goes to trial – or he doesn't go to trial. There's a grand jury that could have indicted him, and they won't. And it's on the back – off the back of this receipt that they won't do it. And Wilkerson, this detective, is like, no, this is all – influence peddling this is all frank jones trying to get this guy off because he knows that if he doesn't get him off he's probably going to talk and get him in trouble and all that stuff right what's interesting is that there's eyewitnesses who had who saw mansfield in Villisca the morning of the murders meaning he couldn't have been in illinois right so there's that i don't believe he was in illinois at all yeah exactly exactly you don't keep your receipts in this time either. He's a cokehead. Cokeheads don't keep receipts anyways. <laughs> Much no, less he's now. Just going for think, you think in his like his little handkerchief that he has tied around a stick when he's jumping from train to train, he has it's full of receipts for his taxes. No. It's called it's called a bindle. It's full of cans of beans. It's called a yes. bindle. In his bindle. <laughs> bindle. Are there receipts? No. So so this guy ends up getting off. This guy, Wilkerson, the detective, won't let off this. He's basically like, this is rigged. This guy fucking did it. That guy paid off people to get this guy off. Long story short, they sued this detective into oblivion. So because he couldn't get convicted, so they sued him for libel. You got to prove that it was, a, it, was a, um, uh, it was true when you said it. They couldn't do that, and so they sued him into oblivion. And so anyways, that was the, the end of the Mansfield-Jones connection to this murder. The other suspect is an obvious sex offending pedophile looking freak. Sorry, I shouldn't say freak. Okay, anybody who hears this, sorry. It was a guy named Reverend George Kelly. You want to look this guy up? He looks like he has a weasel. He has a weasel face, like a no. rat face. Um, I'm not surprised to hear the word reverend. Yeah, obviously. In that. So, okay, Taylor. Ew, yeah, no, not great. Listen, I will be honest with you. I have kind of a bias against reverend pastors, preachers, whatever. And this guy was a traveling preacher. Yeah. And look, I'm not okay, saying okay. I'm not saying all preachers are sex offenders, okay? I'm not saying that. But if you're a sex offender, being a pastor is a pretty Same good a lot job. of them are. <laughs> pretty good 100%. gig. It's a pretty good gig. And <laughs> yeah. Especially I'll a traveling say, one. You can just like do whatever you want. So easy, right? So one thing about Kelly is that he did not have a really good track record. So one thing he was known for was like pervy things he would do with like young women and like girls, which like I'm not going to get into. Use your imagination, whatever. Uh, but it was just like known it. around. It was just known that this guy was like, you, you don't want your like 
16 year old daughter around this guy basically and 100 now and this guy basically just blew into town as this traveling preacher for children's day do his sermon get his applause pick up whatever and add it to his bindle stick because i'm assuming he also has a bindle stick because everybody here in this time period probably did and then go back home yep he was <laughs> there the night the moors were killed he didn't leave town until like 5 a.m or so the next morning so he was definitely there was he there for and- children's day yeah, he was there. He was there preaching. Chris. Yeah. And, and the word was that uh, Josiah, I didn't write this in the outline, but the word was that Josiah wanted to meet the preacher. He wanted to meet his family. And so th- he made a point to introduce him and his, like, two daughters and these two other girls that were, like, with, that were staying with him to this traveling sex offender. So there was that. <laughs> he, <laughs> he, Sorry, I laughed. That's your fault. So police look at this guy and they're like, okay, there's obviously something going on. He looks like he has a weasel's face. His mouth is too small for his body, which we shouldn't judge people for that because I also have that same problem. But police arrested him and questioned him. And this guy, the the reverend, confessed. He confessed the killings. Are you laughing at at my mouth? I'm laughing too. I guess you do. Are you saying you have a small mouth? (laughs) That's, That's what I've been told. I'm so sorry that I'm laughing at that. I don't know why. That's, that's not funny. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thank I'm you. sorry. You're telling me that you're you're telling me the things that you are insecure about. And I'm laughing at them. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I, to be fair, I, I didn't. I didn't think you take me ser- take it seriously. <laughs> um, that's really funny. You're like, I, as a man who also has a small mouth, <laughs> we should not judge people. We should never judge people off the sides of their mouths. Weasel faces, yes. <laughs> So, sorry, I'm sorry, he guy. So they arrest this weasel face sex offender and he confesses to the killings. And it wasn't like a super detailed confession. He basically said some of the effect that he was walking around the town, the night of the murder, he came across the Moore house, a voice inside him told him to go find an axe and start killing. It sounds like kind of nonsense. And so one account I read was that investigators believed that the killer was left handed. And so they asked this reverend to chop a piece of wood to see what he would do. So he gave an axe, mm-hmm. which feels like the last thing you would give an axe murderer is an axe. You really <laughs> thought it. <laughs> you feel like you try to give them more blunted instruments. Than That's that. fair. And he, uh, and yeah, he like chopped the wood with his left hand. So like, oh, this guy obviously has to have done it. And, and there was the fact that he was a known pervert and this little girl's pants were like pulled down. So like there was that piece yeah. of it as well. So at trial, his attorney said that he gave this confession under duress and that his wife would testify during the trial. That he, I can't imagine a woman like saying this about their husband. She goes, my, my husband was a weak-minded man and he had previously confessed to an arson that happened on the night that he was literally at home with me. Like he could never have done that arson. It does not shock me that he confessed to the eight murders of these, like this family. Uh, and that, I mean, that happens so much. Like so bizarrely but like people are always confessing to shit that they didn't do hey you know what i saw the um the the one about the um those kids the new york time uh uh, the central park five or whatever Mm -hmm. and in that case Mm -hmm. i get it it's like you got a bunch of like eight-year-olds like of course they're freaked out the cops tell them you're gonna go home if you confess but you can't be a fucking trap preacher and like in your 40s or he was 34 at the time well i feel like i'm not even saying that like it sounds like She's saying that he would just confess to crimes that he couldn't possibly have done. You know, like people who like call and they're like, I'm a Zodiac killer. And they're like, no, you're not. I don't know. I mean, if you don't have a hobby. Right. <laughs> I guess it's a hobby, but it's wasting police time. If you're bored enough. I mean, I could see myself calling the cops and just confessing to random things. Maybe not eight murders. Oh I feel like I feel like that would be like pretty over the top. But, you know, something innocuous. Oh like I'm the one who stole the Kit Kat at the 7-Eleven down the street. Catch me if you can. It was me. Yeah. Catch me if you can. Uh, so the jury in the, in his trial, they were hung. So eleven people voted to acquit him. One voted for not guilty by reason of insanity. Fair. So one person thought that he actually did it out of twelve. He was retried, and then on the on the retry, he was fully acquitted. So there again, like I said, there were a few other suspects. Basically, just any person that the town thought was kind of weird was considered you know, uh, potentially part of this problem. 
I read an article about the killings by an author named Catherine Ramsland, which you may have heard because she's been referenced in last podcast and other podcasts quite a bit. She's kind of mm-hmm. amazing. So she writes all kinds of stuff, all kinds of stuff on true crimes, sexual deviant behavior. She wrote one about like why people want to have sex with dead bodies, which like, I didn't know, I didn't know that many people did, but enough for a book, but like, is it, it, all is, it is, I, enough to author a book on it i would i would assume she has a master's on psychology on forensics on criminal justice she's wrote about 25 books and um and she wrote about this one as well she ended up writing about uh robert wrestler who's basically the person who like coined the phrase serial killer and like his fbi work and his profiling work is like what the world Mm -hmm. looks at now in terms of how to identify who serial killers are and robert wrestler did his take on who he thinks the Valeska murder could have, not who it could have been, but who it would have been if it was like based on a profile. And he concluded that the killer was an obviously mentally ill man in his mid to late thirties who was well-built and his profiling based on like what he was saying here was that Reverend Kelly would ne- could never been the killer. He was too meek. He was too small. He was a tiny, frail, fragile mm-hmm. guy. It never could have been him. Yeah. Ramslin posits that the killer may never have been identified or interviewed anyways out of the dozens of people that were because it could have been a transitory person, kind of like you said. That's what I think, too. I mean, like, that guy's got to be gone, like, to the wind, gone. You'll never find him. In the middle of this, I found another person. Oh, my God. Can you please – I just – okay. Can you – can you – Please DM me your address so that I can call nine one one when you stab yourself in the face with this axe that you're playing with right now. Because now you're you're holding the axe backwards and pointing at me with it. So I just need to be able to call the ambulance to your home. Now it's a gun. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> oh man, that is sharp though. Um, so so I found this other guy that was like a totally unknown person until 1999. This guy was an illegal immigrant from Mexico who literally just rode the rails across the country and would just hop off, kill somebody, and then hop back on the rails and go. Like, he would just do – the only he would only get caught for, like, immigration reasons. Like, he was deported four times. He was never caught Mm -hmm. for the killings themselves until 1999. So he was operating for 13 years – killed 16 people just by being on a train, hopping off, going to town, killing someone by the tracks, then hopping back. In. Like, how are there so many of these people? It sounds like that's something you could just do. But this isn't the 1800s. This was 1999. It's almost... Oh, that guy did it. Wait, that guy did it in 1999? Yeah. Oh, that is weird. <laughs> I thought you meant they they discovered that story in 1999, but you're saying that he did it in 1999. No, yeah, no because, right. because Catherine Ramsland was like, hey, like, look, we have all these random townsfolk suspects that we're looking at. It could have been, like, anyone. And, like, here's evidence yeah. of that. Like, exactly. in like, 1999, anyone. this random dude just fucking, oh, dude, crazy shit. And so, yeah. so, we, so we don't know. So I wrote down that on Act 3 for our conclusions, my guess is that Mansfield guy is probably the most likely to have done it because I think it's weird. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like what you said, if you're like digging on your property and if you find like too many dead babies, you know, there's like a finite limit right. of dead babies you could find. Like One's okay. Cause like that's an accident. It could have been anything, but like seven <laughs> means you're a baby murderer. Yeah. Like Taylor, if you found out that I systematically killed my entire family with an ax, well, you don't know that. You find out that I lost my entire family to a, a mysterious axe murder that was never caught. And then, like, yeah. eight months, nine months later, You're I'm, talking arrested, I'm arrested. Yeah, I'm arrested with, mm-hmm. on, on charges of killing a family. With, it's like, that's one too many. Like, you weren't found yeah, yeah, guilty, yeah, yeah. but it's like a, one too many. Yeah. So we're on the same page we think as this guy. Well, I think so. I think, is this the one also, I feel like in that man from the train book where he talks things it was Paul Mueller in or whatever, just like a transient, like there was a thing, is it this house that had the creaky step? And then in the book, the man from the train, they were like, he probably just like ran up the stairs really fast. And then, cause like, how could you kill everybody so fast? Or at least without anybody waking up except that one little girl. So I, so 
for one, the two girls were downstairs in like a totally separate part of the house. So like feasibly, right. I could see that happening. The harder thing to believe is him. Wait, actually, it's not because what happened was he started on Josiah, went to Sarah, went to the kids' room, went back to Josiah, then went downstairs to the two little girls. So Josiah, yeah, so, he, so he might have like hit Josiah, fuck, like knocked him out, and then went after Sarah because Sarah was probably waking up at that time and was like, okay, I don't have time yeah. to finish them off right now. I got to kill the rest of these guys and I can come back, which is like an insane, ludicrous thought. What's also weird is that he used the axe blade on the adults, but the blunt end on the kids. See what I'm doing? Huh. Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, I don't know what that is. Oh my god, please be careful. That is weird. And another question that I have for you. Did you mention that the little girls are were just sleeping over and they just like weren't supposed to? They just asked their sister and she was like, sure, you can sleep over. Poor baby. Poor family. Poor mom and dad. Everyone that's so sad. Just like one night sleeping over at your friend's house and like you get murdered. That happens to be the axe murder night. And then also, did you talk about like there was like that like bacon on the floor? Did you hear that? I've never heard that. The, the one that like around like the two little girls downstairs there was like a slab of bacon on the floor, which like the guy probably used to sexually assault them, if or at least or to like masturbate with it as like a thing. What? That was this? I think it's this one. I think so. I don't know. I mean, I went to like mm-hmm. some details about like the the. So there's parts of the yeah. There was a, crime. a four pound slab of bacon taken out of the ice box and laid next to the ask ax ask ax. Anyway, so I, I know that he had a wash basin left downstairs, which is where he would wash his hands, and maybe I missed the axe part or the uh, bacon part. So wait, he had sex with the bacon. No, he like used it as like lube to like masturbate over their dead, bo- their dead bodies, potentially. Man, times were times were like, rough back then. <laughs> like you had to fucking you had to have a whole hog next to you. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, that is that's it. So I think so. It, it, the only person that actually went to trial was the sex offending weasel face, and he got off, and he probably should have gotten off because he probably didn't do it, even though he's actually probably a sex offender. And then you got uh-huh. uh, the Mansfield guy. And then the other guy, Frank Jones, he went on to become a senator. Good for him. Yeah. It's fitting. I, um, uh, what do you... And then what they do... Now the house, you can go there, right? You can go there. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just like the Winchester house. It's like a tourist spot. Wow. Eee. Stop Please. acting at me. I don't like it. I'm going to hit the computer and fuck it up. <laughs> That's really scary. Just like someone can just walk into your house. You and then what? disappear. Taylor, they Taylor, just disappeared. Taylor, can I tell you what I did last night? It was yeah. really scary. So I went to the movies. I was out of the house for like probably three and a half hours. We had dinner beforehand. Uh-huh. I get home. The fucking front door's open. What? I didn't. I I either didn't lock it or what. I, my assumption is that nobody opened it because there was dogs there and they were still there and they were fine and nothing was missing. But now I'm like, they could have just came in and they're like in my attic. You don't have like a camera or anything. Oh, uh, I can look at the camera. That's a good point. I do have a camera. You look at the, the camera. camera. That's really scary. I should look at the camera. Yeah. Let me know what that says, because I'm very curious. Um, if I die, who inherits my share of the podcast? Me, me. I'll do. I'll do it by myself. You're gonna do it by yourself. Yeah. You would do that. Yeah. What else am I gonna do? It's true. Wait, the movie was at seven thirty. So, okay, we left the house. Let's see. It's six. Okay, so that's a dog. My God, if you see a video of someone getting into your house and climbing into your attic right now, I'm going to lose my mind. Man, how fucking cool would that be for Halloween, though? The story, this podcast, the next episode could be like the Fars axe murder. The story where Fars gets chopped in half. Okay, that's me. Good. This is still me. That's a man in a scream mask. Not good. <laughs> Not good. <laughs> a little, a little troubling. Oh my god! 
Uh, actually. So creepy. Yeah, we walked over to the front door and I was like, this is open. <laughs> <laughs> but wait, you don't see anything? Is this open? No. Then that's okay. Like, unless the person, like, I don't know. Okay, and then we got home at 10.02 and that is me walking in the front door. All right, I think I'm good. I'll keep my axe with me, though, anyways. Yeah, yeah, and John, with you. And John's coming over. So, John's oh, yeah, obvious. No, he's a much easier target than I am. They'll, he's definitely go for John <laughs> first. For sure they'll go for him first. Perfect. It's perfect. Um, oh anyways, on that note. That's, that, should, that was scary. Yeah, I should, um, I should probably wrap. Um, do we have anything we want to tell people? Oh, no, just the usual. Please um, give us five stars on Apple Podcasts if you see us. And if you like it, please subscribe and share with, with someone who likes podcasts. That's really the best way for us to get out there is, is tell your friends. We're at Doom to Fill Pod and all the socials. Oh, my God. Farce. Are you seriously itching your beard with that axe right now? Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> the blade feels nice. We're going to be on the news really soon for Farce. Somehow... Hurting himself with the axe, podcaster dies by mysterious World. axe in his office. It turns out he did it to himself by accident somehow because he was like, messing around with his axe. World oh famous God, podcaster and celebrity, far so can Sanch. Axe Everybody himself in the face. Be um, be their friends. <laughs> please, please do tell people, please do write to us, stupidophilipod at gmail.com. Uh, we are gaining some pretty solid traction, which feels awesome, and yeah. we would love to hear what from you, you. What do you keep under your bed? For yeah, what do you keep under your bed? Yeah. Let us know. Yeah. Doomedophilipod at gmail.com. Is it an axe? If it's an axe, do you also 